Good morning, everybody. We did everything at church except I got myself, except getting myself into Zoom. That was like the, the, the thing I was just doing, silly me. So about half of you are in Zoom and half of you are here in person at the church. It is great to see you, whether we are seeing you corporeally in the sanctuary or corporeally somewhere in Zoom. Welcome to Jackson Community Church. Welcome to a communion Sunday. And please remember that because it is a communion Sunday, especially if you are at home, this would be your chance to gather up your communion elements. It can be any type of beverage that you have and any type of breakfast or snack on which you would like to nosh while we are together. And it becomes sacred because of our gathering, because we bless it, and because God is present with us and every meal and every chance to break bread in the presence of love is sacred. We do have a few other announcements for the life of the church and the community, so let me start with those before we turn to worship. First of all, housekeeping things. The deacons will be meeting this Tuesday at 7 o'clock. We will use the usual Zoom link. It's a Zoom meeting. We will be having a work day on the interior of the church and possibly a little bit on the exterior Next Tuesday morning, that would be August 10th, we will send out a little reminder. Anybody, if you're free, we need some hands, all hands on deck, just to sort of get us ready for a large event, because on Thursday, Bob Corrigan will be remembered here in our church, and they're expecting overflow into the room out back, uh, because he was a well-known figure in our community and to prepare to welcome everybody to our church we need to just spruce ourselves up a little bit and clear away the visual clutter here so we would love your help next tuesday morning to prepare for the memorial which will be hosted here on thursday august 12th more information to come about all those details but feel free to put them on your calendar now we are planning to go forward with our Tuesday, August 17th, golf tournament. Um, it's, it's a modest tournament. We're gonna make sure it's not too crazy um, in terms of prizes and stuff like that, but it should be fun. So if you haven't signed up to be a foursome, I need three partners. So any three people that wanna do a Thelma and Louise ride with me around the course, feel free to find me after church because I'm not really too much about like hitting the ball or getting it into the hole. I'm just more about the driving the golf cart and having some fun. So I don't take it seriously. Other people do me. I'm just going to go there and have fun. Serious fun. Remember also that for the next six weeks, starting today, Po Jen will be a visiting preacher in Bartlett. Um, their service begins at 10 a.m. So we know that some people will probably dip in and out of both places and really take the chance to savor Pogen's presence in our community. They're doing it both on Zoom and also in person. So you can either attend in person or you can request the link from the Bartlett Church. We just want to encourage people to feel free. You don't have to not tell us. You don't have to pretend <laughs> you're going. Just enjoy Pogen if he's here and you want to be here in his company. It's all good. He's been coming to our C3 Bible studies on Friday evenings quite often and adding his wisdom long before he even came to the Valley in person to be a guest preacher again. So we're happy to have him in our community. We do, I just want to remember too that in September, there's a couple of things. One, we're going to have a retreat at Star Island. I believe there may still be space. So if there are people that are feeling you need a week set apart to kind of reset your life, this is a lovely opportunity. Many people have gone in the past. I went two years ago and it was very restful. We have couples going now, so I encourage families to consider coming. 
it's midweek one. It's the first full week of September, so I think it's like the 6th through the 10th, something like that. And we have two walks. We have an Alzheimer's walk and a Jen's Friends walk. If you are interested in supporting, either sponsoring or participating in either of those walks, you can let the church know if you want to be on the Jen's Friends team that we're going to field. Or you can contact Jeanette Heidman directly if you wish to be on the Alzheimer's team. Uh, we have been sending out the links to be participants in those, but we'll send them again in the August newsletter so you have a chance to sign up or sponsor your friends and make a difference. Are there any other announcements for the life of the church? Um, yeah, can, can you clarify the um, cleanup day and Bob's memorial? Is it this week, the third and the fifth? No, it's next week. Next it's week, the, the 10th, 10th and the 12th. And the 12th. Okay. Uh, no, they're planning a week out. They know that it's going to probably be a very large gathering given that he was a beloved teacher here. So they're taking their time and just pour, you know, gathering up their resources and focusing and making sure that the family can all be present. So that's the scoop. I'm just going to mention that today, in a private event, uh, both Jim and Jean Porath will also be remembered. That is not open to the public. It's just a private family gathering. But we are seeing a lot of memorials. We're seeing a lot of events that have been postponed because of COVID begin to happen now while people can gather. Any other announcements for the life of the church or the community? Final remi reminder that on August 22nd, we're going to have a church barbecue after worship. Our youth will be helping lead that service and we have a guest speaker. His name is Vince Skelton. He is a very inspiring speaker. He gave a commencement address at his college after he received his master's and he discovered the love of skiing through the adaptive skiing program here in New Hampshire. He lives with cerebral palsy and he's a remarkable young man. He's also a classmate of my daughter, Jesse. He's the age she would be had she lived and he's an inspiration. He's come and spoken here before about five years ago in the winter to talk about hiking up Mount Washington. And now he's coming to talk to us about you know, living with challenges, overcoming challenges, and how every day is an opportunity for all of us. So if you get a chance to be part of a community barbecue, an inspiring speaker, August 22nd. Lots of announcements. So now let us turn to the reason that we are gathered here, and that is to worship. We ask you all to grow quiet, Put your feet either on the floor or the earth if you are inside. Maybe close your eyes. Open your hands. Relax yourself and receive the gift of meditative music offered to us by Alan. We turn now to the call to worship. You'll find it either on your screen, if you are in Zoom, or you will find it 
in your bulletin if you are here in the sanctuary. This is adapted from a reflection by Father Richard Rohr. The hiding place of God, the revelation place of God is in the material world. You, God, came to us incarnate, body, mind, and spirit, and walked among us as Christ. As Gandhi once said, there are so many hungry people in the world that God could only come into the world in the form of food. God, forgive us the desires and the appetites that separate us from the goodness of your creation, your connection. It is marvelous that you enter our lives in the most common way, through the fruit of the vine, the grain of the earth, and the gathering of bodies. From this call to worship, we then turn to the prayers that we share together as a community. We lift up always out loud any prayers of concern that people might wish to share. This morning we'll begin with Zoom. And Eileen, if you'll grab the microphone for anybody here, but is there anyone in Zoom desiring to share a prayer of concern? If so, please do unmute. Okay, it's quiet in Zoom right now. Here in the sanctuary, are there prayers of concern? We have one from Sue, and I think we have one over here as well. Kevin, go ahead. Can you guys double check it's on because I'm not hearing? Press and hold so it's green. Yeah. All right, Sue's going to share that again. Let us pray for our friend Kevin and that he heals and is a happy person. And we expand that prayer to those who are struggling with mental health whether it is mental illness and a specific diagnosis or anxiety, depression, suicidality, and other challenges. This is a hard, hard time right now for people that have these kinds of challenges. And we pray for all that there will be the resources they need and resilience to recover. Cheryl? Um, prayers for Tom's cousin's wife, Sandy, who just underwent uh, double mastectomy. So prayers for uh, healing and recovery. So prayers for Sandy for healing and recovery after a mastectomy, a double mastectomy. Prayers for all who live with the challenge of cancer diagnosis. Again, this is an ongoing struggle for many, many families within our own community. Richard and Sandra are living with this challenge. Cheryl is a, a beautiful survivor, as is Arden and Gloria. We have people that have been quietly going through treatment who choose not to be revealed to all of us, but they have been upheld through the love of their family and their caregivers. We have daughters who have survived. We have people that we have lost to these diagnoses. There are other diagnoses, right? Alzheimer's. Bob Corrigan lived with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, well, dementia and other challenges, yet these were not the cause of his death. 
we have the beautiful family of John and Alice here right now, and their son Brian is here, and I got to talk to him about bird songs yesterday. And he's visiting from the West, and he lives with ALS, and he is dying. And he'll tell you he is dying, and it's a journey that he is narrating and experiencing as he goes. And as his body changes, he finds new passions, and one of them continues to be bird watching and bird listening. So he was teaching me about bird song yesterday. We love people and their bodies change. And our journey through this world is a mortal one that crosses thresholds. We are born into this world and we die out of this world, but love accompanies us. Love gives birth to us and love brings us back in to the shelter of that Embrace that homecoming that is unimaginable to us. But along the way, we love people and we're strong and we're weak and we're resilient and we're vulnerable. And some lives are too short and some lives are long. We are human. And our experience here is the gift of love. We think too of parts of the world that are suffering greatly right now from climate catastrophes, floods, fires, mudslides, loss of life. We add to this the surge of COVID, which is not gone. There are places that don't have the vaccine at all or barely any of it. People have to bring their own oxygen to a hospital if they can even get to a hospital. And our country is not done with it. Our lives are still being transformed by it. So let us not set aside our vigilance, but continue to pay attention to what happens, whether it's right here in our village or in all the places that people who have come in by Zoom live or plant their feet and draw breath, or the places where our far-flung family and friends reside and call home or places that we don't usually see, Zimbabwe, the Chikanga Church in the city of Mutare in the nation of Zimbabwe, the villages in Honduras where Meg has traveled, all the places that remind us that we together, living on this earth, we are the body of Christ. And so when we pray for the body of Christ and we're reminded of it again today, We are praying over a holy body, a holy body that is vulnerable and resilient, a holy body that has been broken, broken so much that it broke open and became the love that flows out to all of us. It's not just metaphorical. When we look into each other's eyes and we see each other's spirits and kinship and friendship and amazing gifts, We are looking into the face of God because God gave to us the responsibility of being the servants of holy love in this world. And however God's love will be made known, it is made known through us. And so as we do, let us pray for the holy body of Christ. Let us place our hands on our hearts or on our heads, or wherever you know somebody needs your prayer, Scamp and her abdomen, Huntley recovering from his heart surgery as others have recovered before him, hearts that are still vulnerable, lungs and brains and bones, so many different parts of the body. Place your hands where your energy might go, And let us pray together. Out of concern, O God, we have raised up Kevin and Sandy. We pray for the Corrigans and the Porafs and all who are mourning those who have gone ahead of us. We pray for those who are with us now, for whole communities that cry out, for those that raise up praise along with their need. 
We ask that you, you will hear us and that you will be the love that turns your face toward us and your hands toward us and reminds us that we are not alone. We are connected because your spirit and your love binds us into this common body that is bigger than one life or one person that stretches across an entire world and calls it home. Amen. Before we turn to the Lord's Prayer, are there prayers of celebration? Let us not forget the joy that also gives us breath and hope and healing. In Zoom, is there anybody that would like to So I'm celebrating the fact that I'm the newest homeowner in Jackson. Oh. <laughs> and within a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, we'll see, I'll actually be a resident again. So I'm very excited about that. Yes, so for homecomings or, or the creation of home, whether wherever you may be planting your roots, Kate and her new location, Jeanette returning to Jackson, Sandy in Ohio. Sandy's off on an adventure right now. Um, may those of us who are unhomed, whether it's Kevin or others, find home. And may those of us that have a home celebrate that we have a place to lay our heads and be sheltered. Judy? Yes, Bill and I are very excited. Our grandson, Chris Horan, uh, just became engaged yesterday to uh, Morgan Heckler. Very exciting. So Chris is engaged. So there's a new family in the, in the making. That is just lovely. And they're buying a house. <laughs> and they're buying a house. There you go. Homeowners and housemakers and family all in one. Lots of, lots of good news there. Are there any people here in this, any, did I miss anybody in Zoom? Anybody else want to speak up? I think Arden's with family this week. She had people flying in last week. And I know there have been other people and thoroughly enjoying their family reunions. Sue had her family here. Other people have had their family here. People have been on their vacations. These are all good things that we want to celebrate. Anybody in the sanctuary wish to lift up anything in celebration? Eileen will bring you the microphone if you have anything to share. Okay, everybody's super quiet this morning. Well, I'm going to give thanks for birdsong. Learning something new at any time in your life is a gift. Uh, we are curious, wonderful creatures made by God with the gift of learning and growing to the last breath we have. So we give thanks for our capacity to remain sponges that soak up and learn about the world and connect. We also pray a prayer of celebration for new life, for people that are going to become grandparents or parents, for people that have just welcomed a new soul into their families, uh, some through adoption. I'm working with one family who has a new grandchild coming as a six-year-old into the family, and others who are expecting a baby or have just welcomed a baby for new life and the beauty of family of all kinds. We give thanks. Now, let us lift our voices up together. Please, if you are in Zoom, unmute because we would love to hear your voices as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, Father, Lord in heaven, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. 
And if you would rise, if you're in the sanctuary, please, if you are able, if you are able or feel free to sit if you need. We're going to sing hymn 23, we gather together. There should be three verses. And if you are at home, you will see the verses on the screen. And we hope this one's familiar enough that we can get by by singing. Everybody here is chuckling because at least they're trying it together. But you won't know what they sound like, I don't think. Now, I love to surprise people who weren't expecting anything, but I would love Lori to read the scripture to us. Yeah. How's that sound? It's on the back of the bulletin, and I'm going to get you to come up here, and I'm going to steal a microphone. Yep. Come right up to the pulpit. It's boring when it's just my voice. Wow. Oh, I have to see everybody. <clears throat> okay, kids, here we go. Nice to see you all today. I do love doing this. I don't want to act like I don't. Scripture, Matthew 11, 1 through 18. Now, when Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and to proclaim his message in their cities. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is everyone who takes no offense at me. Jesus praises John the Baptist. As they went away, Jesus began to speak in the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who wear soft robes are in royal places. What then did you go to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you 
who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied under until John came, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is vindicated by his deeds. Yay, Lori. You can even applaud her if you want. I mean, that was courageous. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It's a long passage, but I chose it for two reasons. One, because of course it talks about food and drink and today is Communion Sunday, so any way that we can tie together the themes of our service is wonderful. And two, because we are hoping to focus on the humor and the recreational or self-care choices of Christ over the course of this month. And when I read commentaries about the humor of Christ, because there is no line that says Jesus laughed. There's one that says Jesus wept. But there isn't one that says Jesus laughed. You have to work a little harder and look a different way at the stories of the gospel to see all the different ways that Christ took care of himself that he might be available to others. But one of the ways that he used humor was to reflect back the ridiculous, the contradictory. One could hear in this passage some sardonic humor. That's the word that we landed on at the Bible study at Friday at five o'clock, sardonic. And I thank Tony for that word. That was his word and it was the right one. Jesus says, you know, John is this amazing guy. There had not been a prophet acknowledged by the Jewish community in hundreds of years. They had not heard directly from God through the figure of anybody prophetic for a long time. And any time you're that long parted from the one you worship, you struggle with whether God is even paying attention to you, whether God even cares anymore or will come back to you especially in a time when there is a strong occupying government who is oppressing your people. You have to wonder, where is God in all of this? And then along comes John, and he was not the only person in his day to claim that he was the prophet or a, a messiah. There were a lot of people performing miracles, showing up and saying, hey, I'm the one you've been waiting for. But when Jesus and then the gospel writers turn to the text of Isaiah, they say, we read this one way when we were in exile and you were talking to us as a people in exile and you said, one will come who will prepare the way for you. But now, Living in our times, in the times of Christ, 
We understand this differently and we see in the figure of John, the one who came to say, hey, pay attention. Things are about to change. They may not change the way you want them to or the way you expect them to, but everything is going to change. Jesus says that John was one of the greatest people to walk the face of the earth. But then he says that really puzzling line, yet in the kingdom of God, he is among the least. And that's a puzzle and we're gonna come back to it and we're gonna talk about why when we think about sitting at the table as people accuse Jesus of doing, sitting down with tax collectors and sinners, which is, uh, I mean, that could be all of us. We could go to the table. He changed the way we think about who is most important and what do those who lead do at a table. But first, let's think about the humor that he used when he wound up this part of the story. He is critiquing society here. Right after this passage, he goes on to name different cities, the ways that they are in trouble, they're not serving their people well, and if they don't change, they will not survive. He's critiquing entire social structures. He's certainly critiquing governments and communities where there's corrupt leadership where those who are most vulnerable are not being cared for. But right here, he talks about what they say. They say that because of the way John eats and drinks or doesn't eat and drink, he's very picky. He only eats, you know, locusts and honey. Actually, locusts, are, it's not locusts, it's a kind of bean, but it's a mistranslation of that word. And so people traditionally think that John was out in the wilderness eating bugs and honey. It was actually beans and honey. But John was very careful about what he ate. And he ate mostly things that were wild and raw. And so people said, well, he has a demon. And then Jesus, who we know loves to eat and probably enjoyed drinking. Hey, he turned water into wine at the wedding. Why would he turn down a good cup if it was offered to him. They call him a drunkard and a glutton. And he's teasing and he's saying, look what people say. But wisdom's, wisdom will be vindicated through the deeds, through the acts of our lives, through where our feet have walked, through where our hands have reached out, through the words that we have spoken, through the people that we saw with our eyes and heard with our ears and the people whose invitations we received and accepted and the people to whom we extended an invitation and said, you belong in this community. You are my brother. You are my sister. You could call me a drunkard and a glutton all day. I'm gonna sit down with the people who belong in the kingdom of God. And when Jesus says that John, the great prophet, is the least of those who are in the kingdom, it goes right along with all the people that he sat down with. He sat down with the outcasts and the undesirables. He went to the homes of women. He sat down with the lame. He touched the lepers. He listened to the cries of people that were ignored for decades who needed healing. He fed people that were hungry long before he said, hey, I've got something to say to you about God. You better listen. He fed their bellies. He made sure their thirst was quenched. He paid attention. He made friends with Roman officers. He pulled tax collectors out of their offices, got them to come down out of trees, went and sat in their homes. Those were the people that bridged the Jewish community and the Roman empire. And they, completely represented everything that was unjust and oppressive about the system in which people lived. And he said, 
They have something to say, and I believe they have something to offer, and they have hearts that can be open and ears and eyes that can be made to see and hear so that they can be restored to their community and they belong in the kingdom of heaven. Why is John the least among all of these? I think because of the wisdom that David Perkins has shared with us about how leaders in the military feed their people. Simon Sinek turned it into the title of a book, Leaders Eat Last. And if you go on retreat at Horton Center and you're lucky, you'll get to eat what we call an agape meal. At an agape meal, everybody has food. It's all sitting out there on the table, but you can't ask for anything for yourself. You can only talk to people and offer them things, but you can never say what you need. And it's like the story of the people that in hell or in heaven have a really long fork. Let's call it a spork, a fork or a spoon, right? It's so long. Our kids have demonstrated it in children's sermons. You can't feed yourself with it. It's so long, there's no way to get it into your mouth. You can scoop something out, but it'll never get to your mouth. In hell, you keep trying to feed yourself. What do you think they do in heaven? How do you think they take the spoon and turn it into something that makes it possible for all people to be fed? Tell me, what do you think? Whether you're in Zoom or the sanctuary, Give me your thoughts. You feed someone else, says Sandra, and that's exactly right. You take the spoon and you scoop up something and you offer it to a person that can't feed themselves. And the same happens at an agape meal at the retreat center at Horton or any place else you go where they're having an agape meal. If you want something on your plate, you have to hope that someone else sees you because your plate will stay empty unless someone else serves you. You can't reach for your own stuff. You can only ask that others will pass you what you need or put it on your plate or fill your glass so that you too will be fed and your thirst will be quenched. When leaders eat last, it's because they make sure that all who have done the hard work of the march or the walk or the service have what they need. And then and only then do they sit down to the table to eat. If John is the leader that we believe he is, he's the last to break bread and he's the first to offer it to someone else. Just as Christ took whatever was given to him, he gathered it up, he received it. He offered it first to God and said, thank you. Thank you for the gift of this and for the grace to make it enough. And he called God's blessing and presence into it. And then he didn't use his own hands and take off a piece and start eating. He handed it out to those who worked with him and followed him. And he said, here, make sure everybody gets some. And through our hands, just like the hands of the people that followed him and passed out loaves and fishes at the feasts, there was enough and more than enough for everyone. You could either even gather up what was left over do you think this man who makes sure that everybody has enough and loves to sit down at a table with anybody that will offer him food or to make sure that the people that came to him with no provision get what they need, do you think he cares if you call him a drunkard or a glutton? If that's what you understand about what he's doing, 
go ahead and call them names. Because the people that need love will show up at that table every time and people that didn't even know they were hungry or thirsty will come to a place where they will be fed. And the work of our world is to meet the essential needs first of the people that God loves. And that's all of us. And that's people that are our neighbors who are unhomed or in recovery or living in another place where there's a flood or a fire or a famine. God shows up as real love. Love you can eat, love you can drink, love that will ask you to sit down together. And when you sit down someplace, People aren't an institution anymore. When you sit down with somebody that doesn't agree with you, or you sit down with somebody you're afraid of, and you share a meal, and you grow quiet, and you listen, you're not looking at a stranger anymore. You're looking at a person with whom you have dared to share a meal and find something in common. At the table, things slow down. And yes, there are messy family meals where people still argue and fight or they can't talk about everything because everybody's going to like throw everything down if they do. But in general, we can find a way to be together at a table. Love is real. We know it shows up in a lot of places, not just our dining rooms. Jesus didn't care if you called him a drunkard or a glutton because he loved food and he loved to drink with his friends and he took care of his body and other people's bodies because that's what love does. Love cares first for what you need and then love reaches deeper and says, hey, do you wanna listen? Or do you have something you need to tell me? Cause I'm here to listen. And when you get up from the table, you are changed. It doesn't matter what they call you. Wisdom, wisdom will be proven out through the deeds of love. Thanks be to God. This morning, we will first ask for your faithful giving, and then we will turn to communion. So for just a moment, Alan will offer us music, and if you need to put something in a plate or prepare it to put in a basket as you head out, or make a donation to jxncc.org, or drop something in our mom's book. Brothers and sisters, if you didn't already hear what I said, know that all people are invited to a table that is set not by you or me or this church or any denomination or any authority or power on earth. This table is created and filled by love itself, by holy love, and no one is turned away from this table. If you wish to partake, if when you are invited, you choose to eat or to drink or simply be in the presence of love, you are welcome.
you'll find the Sursum Corda and Sanctus. Actually, we're going to start with the Confession, and then we'll move to the Sursum Corda and Sanctus. You'll find it either in your bulletin or on the screen, and it's very short and simple. This morning, we ask forgiveness, and this is for all of you to say together, for missing the mark. And we ask to be called into community and communion with the other messy and beloved people of God. Brothers and sisters, God calls us. And God calls you, each of you, because you are beloved. Your sins are forgiven by a holy grace you cannot buy or earn, but which is freely offered to you. You are forgiven. And now we turn to the source from Corda and Sanctus. You'll find it either on your screen or in your bulletins. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing and giving. Let me just check in and make sure everybody now has communion elements of some kind handy. Does everyone here in the sanctuary have one of our little kits? Not kit Griffin, the other kit. We have a kit Griffin here. Then I would invite you first to peel off the top if you're here in the sanctuary or prepare your bread. I have here a lovely scone from Autumn Nomad. Everybody in the sanctuary is jealous of the scone. And feel free to prepare it to be eaten. And then I ask you to focus as we call our blessing down upon this bread. O oh, holy God, you are the love broken open for us. And you are the presence that breaks open our lives. That there is a place and a space for your love to enter in and change us from the inside out. And so as we take of this bread and make it part of ourselves, we are inviting love inside. Brothers and sisters, take and eat and do so in remembrance of the one whose love changed you. Whether you are here in the sanctuary or you are at home, please prepare the fruit of the vine or whatever beverage you have gathered to become part of communion today. Here is a vessel that was hand-thrown 
by a woman of our community, and it has hearts on it. What a better, no better vessel to hold love than a cup of love. We call down the presence of God. Oh, holy God, your love has flowed through generations. You poured out that love for your people. And now we ask that you will fill us to overflowing, that we too may be servants and vessels of your love poured out into this world. Brothers and sisters, as you take of this cup, do so in the remembrance of the one whose love was spilled out for us. We turn now to the statement of thanksgiving, which you'll find either in your bulletin or on the screen. We are not alone. God made us. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? No. In all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through the one whose love for us has been proven. Neither death nor life, neither messenger of heaven nor ruler on earth, neither what happens today nor what may happen tomorrow, neither power from on high nor power from below, nor anything else has power to separate us from the love of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now you'll find on your screen or here in the hymnal on page 311, the words to the hymn, let us break bread together. And again, three verses with a refrain. I mean, stay standing, sorry, for the benediction, which will now follow. So you'll find it on your screen or in your bulletin.
brothers and sisters, go with love of food and drink on your lips and in your bellies, and may that love fill your hearts and your lives so that you become the vessels of peace and the servants of peace as you go in peace. Amen. Thank you.